the last 24 hours, I've been taking questions from all over the world on a wide range of issues addressed to me as a futurist. And one of those questions has been about food, food supply, and the moral challenge, the, the fact that we have maybe one billion people today who will experience hunger in one form or another at a time when another one billion are going to die of obesity, perhaps. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's not far off the truth. Now, of course, food and food supply has been a very real challenge, especially through 2008 and 2009 when we saw some of the highest food prices that we've seen in a generation, with wheat and other crops going up by up to two or three or four times. Now, it's, it fell through the middle of 2009, partly because of the recession, but we could expect that to climb again. And of course, the challenge has been made more complicated by a strange policy both in the European Union and in the United States of America to take a huge amount of food and turn it into fuel to burn in motor cars um, and, uh, and lorries and, and other things like that. In fact, one-fifth of the entire wheat crop of the United States in 2008 was converted into fuel. Now, you might think that that doesn't really matter, but the UN has an estimate which is that up to 70% of all the food price hikes uh, were uh, actually attributable, related in some way, to biofuel production. That may be uh, a rather high estimate, but nevertheless, uh, it's been a significant component of this challenge. Now, the world was already relatively short of food, and people have been worrying about population growth, which is already 6.7 billion, and due to stabilize at around 9 billion. How are we going to feed all these people? Well, here are a few facts. In India, there were famines on a very regular basis, and, and the international community was often called upon to try and bail out uh, the Indian farmers who did not have the capacity to grow enough food, and there was hunger across that region. As a result, the government of the day introduced what was, became known as the Green Revolution in India. It was a spectacular success. It comprised several things. Firstly, farms were encouraged to, to farm larger territories, to combine small plots uh, so that there could be increased mechanization. Secondly, there was an emphasis on improving the kind of, of uh, seeds that were used, uh, of, of, of renewing the stocks, so that the seeds that were grown were much more resistant to things like drought and disease and would give better yield. Uh, the next thing that happened uh, was that uh, pesticides and fungicides, fertilizers were used, especially fertilizers, in order to increase yield. Um, and then the, a, a further addition was to improve markets and transportation so that less was wasted, uh, just rotting in the field. And as a combination of all of those things began to work, the yields of food in India went through the roof. And that had a further effect on global food prices because it relieved pressure everywhere in the system. Now, that kind of green revolution was copied by many other countries within Southeast Asia, including China. But there's one huge part of the world which has not yet experienced a green revolution of its own, and that is sub-Saharan Africa. You're thinking about places like uh, Nigeria, which uh, has a community of 150 million people. You're talking about places like Uganda with another 34 million people, Zimbabwe with 11 million people. Now, it's true, many people point the finger at countries like Zimbabwe, which has had inflation rates of 1 billion percent per year, which has had a government which has made uh, trading of any kind really very difficult, which has um, uh, destroyed some of the infrastructure that uh, underpinned agriculture. It's true that we can blame governments, but the fact is that there's been a lack of organized transformation of agriculture across the entire region. And in fact, if you fly over Africa, you will see, if you fly over at low altitude, you will see the plots that people farm are very small. If you drive, as I have, over hundreds of miles of rural areas, it doesn't matter whether you're in Zimbabwe or Congo, in Nigeria or in Burundi, you will see the same. That every few hundred yards, you'll see perhaps another hut another villager uh, farming as best as they can another small area and trying to keep the, the, the forest at bay and get out a small crop. But with very limited resources, zero mechanization, uh, with no, no fertilizers or other help, um, and with uh, no infrastructure in place to really get things to market quickly and so on. So Africa is well overdue for a green revolution. And if it were to take place, we would see a huge amount of extra food in the global system. 
Now, there are other challenges. As the middle classes get uh, more numerous in places like India and China and so on, um, they, the demand for meat eating continues to grow, and meat is a very inefficient way to feed people because the cows or sheep or goats or whatever it is that you're growing have to eat grain, and they themselves are very inefficient at converting grain into protein. <laughs> they use a lot of it just to live. Um, so the, the, that, that problem of people converting them from vegetarian type of diet to meat diet or increasing the amount of meat they eat is going to put a further pressure on food supplies. But there's plenty of food in the world currently to feed everyone if it was in the right places at the right time at the right price. And there will be plenty of food in the future, especially if we do see a green revolution. But there's one further thing that we must tackle. In fact, there's two. Firstly, we need to prevent food dumping, dumping of large amounts of food that have been uh, surplus to requirements in places like the European Union uh, and given as food aid to countries, say, uh, such as Sudan or Ethiopia. Now, it may look great to, to stop hunger in the short term, but what you can actually land up do, doing is depressing the prices of food in the, in the local market and putting local farmers out of business. So food dumping, producing food paid for by taxpayers' money in wealthy nations and dumping it in emerging economies where people live on one or two dollars a day, that is just something which has to end. It's a major, major moral issue. And the other side of that, of course, is lifting restrictions that prevents African farmers from selling their surplus into the global economy and African farmers from making sure that their produce does get eaten in places like New York or Paris or London. But there's a further dimension too. Biofuels. When we are using up to a fifth of the, of the, of the wheat crop in the United States uh, to, to, turn, to turn food into fuel, to supply motor cars of tomorrow, to make the United States less dependent on countries like Saudi Arabia for oil or Russia for gas, then we are adding a further distortion into the food market. Because the moment it happens, you create a connection between oil price and food price. If oil price goes up, food price has to go up too. Why? Because the higher the oil price is, the, the greater the financial incentive to buy food and convert it into a form of oil. Um, and if oil prices go down, then food prices go down. And the question is this, do you really want to live in a world where we have a food market going up or down, maybe by two or three times in terms of cost, just as chaotically as oil prices can? We've seen oil prices at $145 a barrel within the last 12 to 18 months. We've seen oil prices fall to around $40 a barrel and now start to ricochet back up again. And this creates chaos in food markets. Now, you may be one thing if you're an airline, but if you are a subsistence farmer, uh, you may be all right because you grow your own food. But if you're someone living in a, in a slum, in an inner city, in a mega city, in somewhere like Calcutta or uh, Beijing, then it's a very different matter. You no longer have the, the, uh, the land to grow your own food. Up to 70 or 80% of all your income is spent every day on buying grains that you cook for your family. And if food prices go up by 50 or 60%, or even 100%, you can't feed your family, you can't eat, and that produces massive social tension. And that is one of the reasons why there were riots in over 38 countries in 2008 when oil, when, when oil prices spiked and then food prices also spiked. So watch this space. Food is a very emotive issue. It's a major moral challenge to make sure that every man, woman, and child can receive a healthy diet. We have it within our grasp to do it, it requires political decision-making, and it requires changes uh, to all kinds of trade tariffs and barriers. But we can do it, especially with new technology and, as I say, a green revolution.